So, Michael, I've been really, really excited to, to, to have this interview for, for a while because I think generally believe that you're one of the most natural educators in the industry, although I know you won't necessarily agree with me from that. But um, it, you seem to have such a big impact, at least in the UK, for the way a lot of personal trainers think about training and mechanics and improving the client's health. So before we go into and delve into training, tell us a little bit about who is Michael Gordon, who's Integra, and how did you become the guy who brought RTS to the UK? Hmm. Um, well, my journey in, in, the, in the gym environment started probably when I was 10 years old. I was taken there by uh, my uncle and I just, I was doing different sports at the time, rugby, and I'm from Yorkshire, so rugby league and football and all different things. And I kind of started that journey when I was 10, started working in the gym when I was 15, opened a personal training studio before I was 20. And then here we are kind of like a few years later. And, and that's, the, that's the kind of the timeline. And, and, and at different points all along that timeline, I was just coming up against obstacles and problems. And, and I'm talking with clients, um, you know, for some people, what I was doing was, was fantastic and they got amazing results. And for some people, it's, it's kind of like we'd press pause on everything. They stayed the same for six months, which for me, one of my core values is progression. That was kind of like, it was like death. And then for some people, they just left, they were frustrated, they regressed, they didn't like what they were, what they were receiving from me. And so all along those kind of years and years and multiple decades of doing this, it's been a case of going, why did Simon not get that result? Why did Jack not get that result? Why did Helen, why did she get a result from the same thing? And so that kind of took me on a journey of just trying to find people and things and workshops and courses and philosophies and principles that I could I could bring back and kind of test out. Hmm. So when it comes to sort of like the mechanics stuff, because it's 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 is the most what's the word I'm necessarily looking for? It's it's the almost most basic concepts in terms of how we move. Right. Everything in terms of programming and nutrition, and training, and all things that lay on top of this. This is the fancy stuff, really. How we move and how humans move and progress is, is the crux of everything. But it's almost quite a new theory for, I presume, in the times that you, you know, you started personal training. It was very much the, the Charles Poliquin era and everything was about strength and different training methods. What was it that made you sort of look outside the box when it came to finding the you know, answers to your questions that you have with all your clients. Actually, when I started personal training, Charles Poliquin was 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 putting things out on T Nation, but he wasn't the, the 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 kind of the global superstar that he became. And his stuff was phenomenal and really influenced what I do. So did Ian King. But there were people before that as well that 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 were were part of that education journey. But it really came down to this. It really came down to for everything that I was doing. I take the rules and I'd go to my client and I would apply the rules. I would literally get a new rule book, whichever course I did, I get a new rule book and I, I would apply it. And then I would just measure, like I would measure my success. And when I would go back to whoever I could speak to, if it was the person who developed this, or if it was someone who taught for them, or if it was someone else, I was just trying to, you know, with, with friends and colleagues, we're trying to figure stuff out. I, I would ask the question like, so why is this like this? And they would go, because it is. And, I, and for me, that was just like, that was kind of like dynamite. You know, it was just like, that's nah, not good enough. I want to kind of, I want to kind of understand this. I want to dig in, into this a, a lot more. And so the, the searching of trying to find the answers to that led me to Tom Purvis. And Tom Purvis has been teaching mechanics for about 250 years now. Like this is not a new concept in his world. This is something that he's been doing all the way back from when in his bodybuilding days when he was at Gold's Gym in Venice Beach. And so he, you know, as, as, as really from the, you know, early 90s, maybe even the late 80s, he has been on this path of trying to understand, you know, what makes up the bench press, what makes up the squat, what makes up the et cetera, and how to apply engineering principles to, to the human body. Because obviously, you know, if we've got something and I don't have anything to hand here that is mechanical in nature, you know, we can see that this plug thing has got a certain 
you know, a certain range of motion that, that we designed. But then when you look at this facet joint and the body of this vertebra, well, that's completely different on every single person, which means that the range of motion available from this particular bone is going to be different for everyone. And so it's really Tom Purvis who founded the resistance training specialist program. He was the one that started to, to, to provide answers to some of those questions. Hmm. So you mentioned obviously you being very, very data driven and you went back and tested all the stuff you learned on your clients. Now there's obviously mm -hmm. the obvious ones. They got stronger, but mm -hmm. what sort of metrics were you looking at to decide whether something stuck, something worked or something wasn't the right approach? Because sometimes you would have to take one step back to take two steps forward. So you'd have to have that faith in something. Hmm. Hmm. So when, when you're thinking about measuring something, you've got the stuff that the client wants and needs. So if a client says, you know, I want to lose body fat, I want to build muscle tissue, I want to develop this part of my body over this part of my body, or maybe they're saying, actually, I want to improve performance, or I want to be able to move better, like something with those goals, we need to figure out, well, how are we going to measure that? How can we justify, you're going to be spending this amount of money, and at the end of this project, this is, this is, these are the results. There's got to be some way of tangibly seeing that. The, the other thing that we've got access to uh, other ways of measuring the success. Um, and so, so some of them might not be so obvious to, to our clients, but if we're assessing you know, how much range of mobility a client has got, we can see the impact our exercises have on their mobility. Did this exercise program, did it increase their mobility of their hip or did it decrease? And we can measure that. We can be really precise with that. You know, did we see that they were able to get onto this leg extension behind me? We could measure with these little moxie sensors. Were we able to deplete the muscle to the level that we wanted to get to? Was this exercise the way that we set up? Was it effective to do that? So, so we kind of, you know, we can, we, can, we can start to go into lots of detail now, right now on the podcast in terms of all of those things. But it's got to come back to what, what is it that we want to see? And what, what is it that's really useful for, for the individual that's in front of us? You know, there's no point um, doing a body fat assessment if that's not the client's goal. And actually, that's not going to be a, a nice side effect of what we're doing. You know, there's the, the, we, we got to get really precise with that stuff. I think Which I think is very different to how I started. Because how I started, everyone followed the same protocol. Hmm. We did the same assessment on everyone. We did the same measures on everyone, you know, the blood pressure and the BMI and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we still do those things, but we get to tailor it now. The, the thing I always, always find with assessments is it's, it's most oh, like underappreciated and overappreciated thing in, in, in the industry. Because as you said, that everyone's going to be slightly different and certain goals lend themselves to certain assessments really well. So for sake of mm -hmm. argument, you mentioned someone wanting to lose body fat, right? It's mm -hmm. easy to have a relative assessment because while every assessment measure has its flaws in terms of measuring body fat, you can get a rough idea of where somebody is. And as long as you're consistent in how you take it, you can see the difference. And we sort mm -hmm. of know where an end goal is, right? So we know where we're mm -hmm. going. So if I want to get mm -hmm. someone to 6% body fat, I know what that looks like. I can calibrate, I can do whatever. The problem comes when we're looking at things like mobility or things mm -hmm. like hypertrophy is like, we, we have an idea, maybe a vague guess of where our genetic potential is without assistance. But if you don't know where you're shooting for, how do you know how far you go? How do you normally hit a ceiling? And the same thing with mobility, you mentioned the facet joint being different in everybody. So how do you start to approach if someone wants to either get bigger or if somebody in turn wants to become more mobile, how do you know how much control you have over that? How much there is a scope of progression to assess? Hmm. I, th I think we have, we have no control over that. Hmm. I think that's, a, that's a, 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 a great question, a great line there. You know, we can set the compass. You have an idea through your extensive experience what it looks like when someone's at 6% body fat. And you've got experience of knowing what were the ingredients, generally speaking, the ingredients to get them to that point. But if you were to deliver the same ingredients to everyone, everyone wouldn't get to 6%. It just, it just doesn't happen. Similarly, if you want to improve mobility, well, we got to kind of go, well, why do we want to improve mobility? 
Is it because they have a functional need to be able to sit down on a toilet or to be able to sit into their chair? Or is it that you want them to squat astagrass? So already we've kind of got this continuum of daily life and performance and be able to do this thing. So number one is kind of figuring out well, why do they want that goal? And then from there, we kind of go, okay, so they can get to a certain point. Do they have the potential to get there? So if we could figure out a way to go, do they have a potential to get there? And then we can start to script those steps. But thinking about mobility, what is it if someone, you know, and for everyone listening, if you think about when you go into a squat, think about your hip. And when you get to the bottom of that squat, your hip is in a flexed position. What's preventing it from going further? So is it that your hamstrings are tight? No, your hamstring tightness is probably not going to be an issue because your knee's flexed. Is it that your glutes are tight? Maybe. Is it that your hip flexors are unable to shorten? Maybe. Is it that that's the shape of your joint? Maybe. Is it that you've got some little uh, uh, disruption on the labrum as a, a client who's just started with us has got? Maybe. So which one is it? And once we can start to figure out which it is, then we can kind of go, okay, this is the shape of your joint. We're never going to increase mobility. Mm. If, I I, if I get really precise and specific, we get to kind of, we get to look at that. Mm. And how do you begin to, because this is going to be a lot of questions. So we, we mentioned off air, right? Like who is this podcast aimed at? And while yeah. there is an element of, of coaches here of like bringing this back to a client centered approach, which is the aim of, of what you do. And I think sometimes mm-hmm. getting lost mm-hmm. in this desire for knowledge and desire to almost sometimes sound smart, but also helping people in the gym for the first time going, right, I need an individualized program. And yeah. how do I get away from gym overwhelm? For somebody who wants to improve their, let's say, mobility, and, and you think, okay, maybe it is the structures to bomb. How do you begin to learn if it is structure, tightness? You know, what, maybe break this down first. Why do people get the sensation of tightness, in your opinion? Well, tightness is, is, is muscle tension. Hmm. And so, and you tend to find this in a, in a group of muscles, but not in others. Like it's very hard for you to feel tightness and tension when you lengthen a a single joint muscle, which is a muscle that crosses just one joint. But something like the pec, which crosses two, we can definitely feel this this kind of tension, this tightness in that muscle. So why do we feel that? We feel that because we're getting into a lengthened position. And once we get that muscle into a lengthened position, we're going to perhaps have an increased rate coding, which is the signal from the brain to the muscle that tells the, 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 the muscle to increase its tension. What I'm trying to get here is, is that once we get into these positions and we get these feelings, your nervous system is kind of like the, the, the conductor for the orchestra. And so when you get that shoulder into a certain position, your brain, the conductor is going, I need more tension here. I need more tightness here. I need to prevent you from going into a particular range. Why that happens, we don't know, because we don't have you in front of us, but that definitely happens. And it might be that you get into the end of that joint range, or it might be that you've got something with the labrum, or it might be that you've just got something going on with a muscle and the brain is trying to protect you. But you know, thinking about who's gonna be listening now, we could dive off into, into some of those reasons, but there's easier, easier ways to, to, to look at this. So. You know, when we're in the gym, we, we always follow the rules, or at least that's, that's when I started off. So 1995, you know, I'm, I'm in the gym and I'm applying, you know, I'm a gym instructor, so I'm applying exercises to people and I'm following the rules. And the rules of the squat is your feet should be hip width apart and you should get your, you know, hip below your knee and you, all of these things. We're doing the bench press and we kind of get into that bench press and we know the rule says, the bar should touch your chest, except that doesn't take into account the length of your arm and how much range you've got the shoulder and all of these things. So an easier way to to look at this would be to go, when you get into that chest press machine or you get into that bench press machine, you wanna figure out, well, how far could you move yourself without the machine pushing you into that position? And so if you guys are listening and you won't be able to see the video, one easy thing that you could do, and, I, and I, I'm, not, I'm really going to impress upon you to do it right now, wherever you are, if you're in a park or a cafe, you're listening to this podcast. 
So I want you to sit upright or stand upright. And I want you to put your arms where you would on a bar. And then I want you to pull your hands back as though you're lowering the bar down to your chest. So you're trying to put your shoulder into that position, how far you can move without the bar pushing you further. And then just take a look and just imagine that there's a line from your hand to your hands. What's the distance there? And that distance represents a potential. We might be able to increase that, but at this point in time, once you get into the exercise, that should be the limit. So, the, the, so we've kind of got a safety thing going on right now. There'll be people who say, they'll listen to this and, and have, have gone into those things of the bar should touch your chest, you, you know, you should squat us to grass. That mm. almost like, if I never go lower than that, how do I improve my ability to go lower than that? It's like, you know, sh we should go lower than that. What would be your answer to that? Why? Mm. Who, who are we talking about and what's the goal? Mm. Like, why should we go like that? So if you have a client who, and I'm going to just say it, a ballet dancer, and that ballet dancer comes to you, and, 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 I'm, and I'm using that reference because we can all get an image. That ballet dancer doesn't have a thick rib cage. She's clearly not a power lifter. That power lifter has got this really thick rib cage. So the rib cage is influencing how effective the pec is. So on the ballet dancer, the pec is not going to be that efficient in the bench press because the angle of the fibers relative to the power lifter. So for the power lifter, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. So we're talking about the pec and we're comparing the rib cage thickness, but the power lifter doesn't have to go as low mm. because the rib cage of the power lifter is higher when they're laid on a bench, they don't have to travel as far. So actually they can fit within the rules and it's gonna have potentially no ill effects. Whereas the ballet dancer that's got these long lean limbs because she's done Pilates forever and that's the kind of the rule right there. Uh, no rib cage thickness. And when she takes the bench press, so the bar touches the chest, there's from neutral, maybe something like 45 degrees of horizontal abduction or adduction behind the body. So the stresses on the shoulder joint are gonna be much more than the power lifter. The potential of the pec to do its job is going to be much less than the power lifter. We're dealing with two different people. So it's got to come back to the why. It's got to come back to who we're talking about and what's the why. I think I think when you look at that as well, I, I remember the the, the 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 image that really helped me was a, a Tom Purvis YouTube video where he had the comparison between I think it was I think it was Ben Pakolsky and somebody else yeah. on that video and how far the shoulder has to travel based off that ribcage angle. That's and, it. You, you'll find the people who the bar doesn't touch the chest are also the, the you know, struggle to get the bar to touch the chest. Also, people that struggle to grow their pecs are the people that come off the mm. bench press and go, oh, my shoulder gets this, my tricep. And their mate with the big bar rib cage goes, no, I don't understand. This is all chest. And yeah. like, when you're looking at that, it's like, okay, if there's, a, if there's a common trend here, what could we do that can actually improve someone's ability to grow their chest? Now, we can talk about whether the, the bench press is a good exercise in general for that person, but could you get more chest out of that exercise by just limiting somebody's range? You know, and I, mm. I, I've used it a lot where I used, call it a squat pad, call it a hip plus pad, whatever you like, to where I can standardize the range a couple of inches off. And there's a massive, massive difference in someone's ability to engage their pec. And I've not really done anything except just, just shorten that range ever so slightly just so they're not having to yeah. dump their shoulders forward as shakes they've ran out of range through the, the glenohumeral joint. That's it. And, 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 and this is a little side note for the, for the coaches and trainers that, that are definitely listening in, because I know you've, you've, you've definitely got a, a big professional following, that the, the stuff that we're talking about today is not what you should do. And I, I, I'm not getting paid for your sessions that you're doing with your clients. You're a professional. You get to make up what you're going to do with your clients. This is just a, a case of, have you ever come across a client that they can't seem to develop their pecs and they're always feeling their shoulders in the bench press? Well, here's one potential solution that you could try out. Here's something that you could test out to see if this is something that you might need to explore with your client. Because essentially, this is, this is what I came up against. I had some clients that had delts. They were walking through. They had to come through sideways through the door over here but they had no development of their pec. 
And they were like, I've been doing bench press for 15 years. My shoulders are sore. My shoulders are massive. I don't have any pec development. Like what gives? And it was, and it, and it was so easy to see. And it was so easy to see because of their sternum angle, their ribcage thickness, all of these ingredients that go into making up a bench press. The bench press itself was not suitable for, for their goal. It's mm -hmm. as simple as that. We get really emotionally attached to exercises. I know I do. There are certain exercises which I just love the feeling of, but that doesn't mean that everyone should do them. And we get kind of hamstrung by tradition and because there's a bunch of people that are very vocal that say this exercise does this. And it's like, maybe for you, but I've tried that exercise on these people and it didn't work. And it comes back to that really trying to, you know, and, and, and this is talking more to the personal trainers in, in the, in, in the room right now, if we're offering something that's personal to the individual, then it, it, it can't be this predetermined fuzziness of, well, it's worked for Arnold and it's worked for actually this guy over here. It should work for everyone. Mm. But it comes... Otherwise, we'd all be doing yoga and getting really flexible. Or we'd all be going and playing basketball and all of a sudden we'd be growing taller. Like it doesn't work like that. That is wish. exactly that's exactly the, the argument I was going to make. It's when, when you see someone come in and goes, I want a swimmer's body. Or I want to, if I, if I play basketball, I'm going to look like a basketball player. It's, like, it's not, mm. it doesn't work that way. And yoga, yoga is another one that I think is the case. So this is, I know like the basketball thing is an extreme example and, and everyone knows you're not going to grow to six foot four by playing basketball. Yeah. But it's, it is the same logic often that people say about with yoga in the sense of, yes, I'm not saying that someone's mobility couldn't improve by being in the positions and holding isometric in these end ranges, yeah. Uh, yoga tends to self-select. The people that yeah. often end up really enjoying yoga classes are the hypermobile, fairly unstable people that can just that feel like they don't look like they have any bones and they can just bend into these positions nice and comfortably. The really stressed, hypertonic individual that you know struggles to get below three inches down on a squat probably hates the idea of going to a yoga class. Now, does mm -hmm. that mean that they should? maybe there's an argument but i'd also have an argument to say that there's there's a reason why the yoga gets the good reputation from a mobility standpoint you know mm -hmm. um and that's yeah. it's 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 a it's a you know if we think about exercise as sport versus health so you know i uh when i was growing up i was uh the fastest in my school 100 meter 200 meter rugby on the wing football on the wing I, I've got no right to be that fast in, in the 100 meter sprint. I should be a little bit taller by, you know, something like six to nine inches taller than I am. But for some reason, I maxed out that window of opportunity, that potential for speed. And so I was fast, but there's a limit and there's a limit. I'm, I'm never going to be, if someone maxes out their window of opportunity, but they've got their architecture set up in a way that allows them to take a longer stride, they're always going to be faster. It's just as simple as that. I am not set up for swimming. I'm not set up for, for playing basketball. I love playing it, but I'm not going to be able to get to that point. And it's the same for yoga. And it's the same for the way that we treat exercise in the gym. If exercise is in, in the gym is, is treated as a sport, then it's, 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 it's always going to be I'm aspiring to this thing that everyone should be able to do rather than going, actually, what is it? Why am I here? And that doesn't mean I play sport. I know you play sport. We come into the gym. We want to, we want to have fun. We want to fall around. We want to see the numbers increase. All of that stuff is really absolutely important for us, especially if you think about adherence and, you know, I've been training for, for, for decades and you have, and many, many of the listeners will have been as, as well. But what are we what are we measuring against? Hmm. If we're if we're thinking about joint mobility in the same way that we're thinking about sport, then we'd start releasing textbooks, which I've got, that say you should be able to get 90 degrees of hip abduction or 72.6 degrees of hip abduction. It's like, no, 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 we're, that's externally measured. Hmm. Actually, what do I have? You know, I've got 25 degrees. And I've got 25 degrees on this side and that's it. And it's not going to change unless you 
try to fit me into this predetermined model and uh, essentially dislocate my hip. I'll change the shape a bit. I'm sure, you know, we'll figure out a way to do that. So, so going back to the, the start of this question in terms of like mobility and what can be improved, because mm. this is good from a, from a client's perspective and a coach's perspective, because you see a lot of coaches go on courses, whether it's, it's learning from, from you and doing the mechanic stuff, or whether it's they go on to some level of therapy, manual release, things of this course. And there's this weird realm where coaches become this sort of jack of all trade, master of none, in the sense that they become either a big heavy strength guy, they, they almost borderline on being a therapist. And from a coach's perspective, or from a general person's perspective going into the gym, what's the scope of what generally can be improved? Or is it a better way to think about it? Work with what you have, work hard in that, and if it improves, fantastic. But at least you're not wasting your time if you if it doesn't. But where's mm. your thoughts on that spectrum? So, so, I, I, and and I, and I want to I want to dance between um, you're thinking about using this for yourself, and you're a professional, and you're you're applying to other people. So, so the first, you know, the first step is figure out what you have. And so that might be, you know, I've got 25 degrees. I can abduct. I can take my leg out to the side by a certain amount. That's what's available. And within that, let's maximize. Let's 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 work. Let's make sure there's no points in the range where we're just wasting time. Let's let's work that tissue. Let's work the muscle. The next level down is kind of going. Let's see if we can get more mobility. Let's see if we can get more, more range within this. So at that point, there's a couple of options. But all we've got to know is once we start to intervene then we're changing what's available. That might have some side effects. It might have some negative side effects. It might have some positive side effects. So we're starting at the top again. And let me just kind of recap, just so it kind of makes sense in my brain and hopefully for people listening. You figure out what's available and you train it. Like that could be where you stop. So exactly what you say, you figure out the kind of the construct, you figure out the, the range of available positions you can get into. And then have at it, train that. The next level down is going, based upon the tools I have available to me, let's see if I can increase this range. How much should we increase it? I don't know, five degrees, a small amount. And then we manage to witness that we can increase the range, and then now we can train it. So we've now changed what's available. And then we go another step further. And that step further might be, can we change it some more? And then can we train that? So there's this micro progression to the to the change in what's available. So what, what tools do we have available to us to change someone's mobility? Well, this now becomes a bigger conversation, right? So we've got stretching. So stretching, does that change mobility? Does it increase your range? Everyone listening will have stretched. Everyone will have experienced. Yes. If it's available, they probably went a little bit further. Sweet. There's some side effects with that stretching. So if you're doing that just before exercise, there's a potential chance, potential, that you decreased the amount of force that you can produce. Uh, that might be a problem. So you've got more range, but you can't produce as much force, and then you're about to do this exercise. Could there be so an temporarily? Sorry to cut you, cut you off there, but could there be an argument there that yeah. for somebody who maybe wants, the goal is to improve their range ever so slightly. And we mentioned earlier on that the nervous system has big impacts in terms of, I don't feel safe in a certain position. Temporarily alleviating some of that um, tension through, let's say, let's say, say for them, I did a couch stretch. I opened up yeah. you know, the rec fem, and then I can get a couple of inches more on a split squat, but I probably have as much force in that range. Fine. But if I'm now going to reinforce that stretch, getting stronger in that little bit of 1% to 2% extra range I now have. So the brain now goes, hey, it's all right being here. I can do this. And that, in turn, will allow that the nervous system to go, no, we're good. We're good in these positions that we might not have thought beforehand. Maybe. <laughs> How would we not? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, this is why, by the way, before I answer the question, but this is why I love it any course with you because it, a question always comes back with a question and it's interesting and this is this has helped me a lot with terms of my education but i suppose you're looking about one how much how much range improvement on the exercise you actually get 
can you get stronger in that exercise over time? And how long does that change stay? If you come back in and it's exactly the same as the previous session, then maybe it didn't make that much of a difference. Yeah. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch it to something that makes sense for me just in, inside my brain in terms of like tight hamstrings. Mm. So you, someone has tight hamstrings and that might be limiting, I don't know, let's say deadlift. Um, you want to do deadlift or an RDL or something like that. And so obviously if you've got tight hamstrings, you're not going to be able to get as low as you might normally want to. So you come in and you put your leg on something and you stretch that and you can go a little bit further. You go do the exercise, sweet. Come in the next time, you have to stretch your hamstring again. You do the exercise, sweet. And you start to do this groundhog day thing where for the next 15 years, hi, I'm talking about my experience right now. You do, you do you know, a hamstring stretch to get more range because you've got this tension on your hamstrings. At some point, we've got to stop and go, why is the tension there on the hamstrings? Like, what, what, what was that about? Like, why is that? And that's, the, that's what I'm doing right now is just I, hopefully inspiring a tiny bit of curiosity and kind of going, yeah, that's, that's right. I've been stretching this muscle every day for, for the last five years. And it doesn't seem to be sticking in that new range. It seems to be a thing that I always have to do. It's kind of like, you know, if you always have to wear knee straps and if you always have to, you know, anyway, that's another topic, but <laughs> that, that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a little dance there in terms of knowing your body as a, as a person listening right now of kind of going, actually, I keep doing the same thing. And is there an alternative? Is there something else that I can do? And for the people listening that, that, that are just going to the gym, I would definitely seek out, you know, wherever you are, uh, a, a professional, even if it's for one session, for them to go, actually, this is why you're not getting into that range. This is why that muscle is, is under tension. It's required because your spinal extensors are really weak. And your nervous system is just trying to hold that pelvis. And it's just trying to stabilize that pelvis. If you just trained your spinal extensors, went and did some 45 degree spinal extension, your nervous system wouldn't require your hamstrings to be that tight. Or maybe there's something going on at the knee and because your gastroc is not contributing to the, to the integrity of that joint, your hamstrings are being recruited to do the same thing. And that's the, uh, I, I always kind of want to say, are you sure? Like, cause that's what we do here. You know, when we see something, we always want to kind of go, but how would we know that? How would we know that to be true? Is there a way that we could, really figure this out with because because you kind of segued onto it perfectly in the sense of how much is like a postural assessment useful because there are there are two schools of thought here based on what you've just said there is there's the one there was the one argument that you said everyone's individual and people have different ranges so could say no they're not because i don't know if I'll use me as an example, my biggest issue for years, and you know, you can probably assess this when I come back to London and you know, you can see it, but it's thoracic extension. Now, do I know without an x-ray that my spine is just a bit kyphotic and that's fine and my range is here and I'm not built for barbell overhead military press. But on the flip side of that, if we look at your example of the hamstrings here. So comparing stretching the rectum for sake of argument to stretching the hamstrings, most not all, but a lot of people who have that sensation of tight hamstrings also have a slightly rotated forward pelvis, which would make the argument that the hamstrings would be over lengthened. So you'd be looking at like, like an elongated guitar string, right? Stretching that more really takes down neural tone. That might be why they're stretching it for years and years on end. Is it relevant to look at the hip and go, the hamstring, that's why you shouldn't be stretching your hamstrings? Or is it going to say, well, I could be wasting my time because I can't see into that hip to know if that's actually an issue at all? It's a great question. It's a great question. So let's, let's go back to our ballet dancer. So we've got a ballet dancer and we've got uh, the power lifter. And, and, and again, I'm using them because I think that everyone can get a good visual representation. So it's, 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 it's probably not lost on anyone that the power lifter has got a different size rib cage to the uh, the ballet dancer, like that's easy. Or let's compare me to an NBA star. 
that dude is twice as tall as I am. And we kind of like, we just accept it. It's normal. You know, we, we have a, a, a different looking face. We, we accept that there's a difference there. And in fact, a really kind of weird thing, if you ever um, take a picture of your face and then flip the image around and just look at it, and that's the way that everyone sees you, you'll look at it and go, who's that? You know, it's, it looks so weird. So we're not even symmetrical. We kind of accept all of these things. And yeah, because we can't see it, we don't accept that our hip joint may be angled in a completely different direction. The acetabulum, which is part of the pelvis, could be pointing more forward or it could be pointing more to the side. So if it's pointing more forward, the range that's available to you in any particular exercise is going to be very different to if it's pointing out to the side. Similarly, you know, if you look at your spine, you, and, and if you guys look up uh, Stuart McGill's work, and he's done lots of work looking at the different shapes of spines around the world. And you might see that in different parts of the world, there's a different shape, generally speaking. And then you come to London where there's over 300 languages spoken and you've got this quite multicultural society. And whoever comes through your door are gonna be presenting with a, a variety of, of what that shape should look like. So who am I? Who am I to say that the shape of their spine is wrong? <laughs> like, and, and I promise you I did that. No, 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 this is, this is, this is, this is too kyphotic. This is too lodotic based upon this kind of image in my mind of what looks pretty or right, or, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it borders on malpractice. Hmm. It borders on malpractice to say, actually, this is, this is where you should get to. And I'm going to do everything that I can. But, you know, as I say, I've been doing this since 1995 and I did all of that stuff. And I was trying to figure out, well, why, why, why am I not improving this guy's thoracic extension? He's coming in and he's too kyphotic and he lays on the table and, and literally he can't touch his head to the table. There's a gap of 10 centimeters. So all I need to do is just get the foam roller. I need to release his sternalis or his rectus abdominis. And I need to do all of this stuff to kind of figure out how to release something that's that dude's structure it doesn't matter what i do all i'm doing is actually just pissing him off all i'm doing is just agitating his joints all i'm doing is just actually he's going to be that group of three where i said people had amazing results some people didn't progress some people got frustrated because i was doing all of this kind of stuff so we gotta, we gotta, you know, figure out a better way. You know, we gotta figure out a better way. How do we assess people? How do we kind of go, this, this is actually what they're presenting with. This is what they're, they're this is what they have available right now. So we need a little bit more detail. So with, obviously there's, there's, there's nothing in, in as you just said, there's nothing innately uniform here. Everyone has, there's so many different shapes, sizes, and everyone isn't symmetrical. But if someone's starting to like, they, they listen to what you're saying and they're going, I kind of get this. I get that I am not yeah. different. Is there anything that they should start to look at and go, so, okay, this is potentially why. For example, and I know I've seen seven foot four people with the world's longest femurs in the world painfully get the world's most perfect squat, especially here in Asia. And I look at it and just go off depressed, wanting to shoot myself. But mm -hmm. for sake of um, is it a uniform thing if you go, look, if, you, if you're very, very tall with a big, longer female, you, that might be a reason why your squat might be tricky. Or is even that uh, a, a, a complete minefield? Is there general things that people can start to look in certain areas for their own performance? You know, you know I think that, that we can have general themes. Hmm. And we can definitely talk about general themes. Like there's a, um, you know, a, a general theme, let's say, that if someone's femur is twice the length of their tibia, which is not as crazy as it sounds, um, then they're going to squat very differently than if someone's femur is the same length as their tibia. So, so, so they're right off the bat. We, can, we, we know that if someone walks in here and their femur is that long, as they go down, because their tibias, their knee's not gonna travel that far forward, their hip's gonna go really far back. That's gonna look like a deadlift, really. 
And similarly, if someone's ankle mobility is quite limited because of the structure or because of tightness, whatever it is, if they can't allow their knee to go over their toes, again, we're probably going to find they're going to be doing something that looks like a deadlift. It's going to be a hip dominant exercise rather than a knee dominant exercise if that concept makes sense to, to people listening in. Um, for, so for sure, for sure. You know, if you've got someone who is, uh, who's the famous footballer that's like seven foot, used to play for England. I'm not the His right rib person cage is, <laughs> No, 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 I know. I'm, I'm probably not the right person either. So, so rib cage, not that thick, but he's got this wingspan. Hmm. Well, when he goes down into a bench press, you know, when I'm getting down into this bench press here, my elbow doesn't really go that far behind my shoulder because I got short arms. But that dude, the thickness of his ribcage, there we go. That's like a, I, I can't quite tell, but I bet that's like 30 degrees back behind. Easily. Mine's five. It's Peter Crouch. He's that's probably one. like 60 degrees. So, which means that, you know, that exercise, yeah, he can still do it. And he probably has done it in his life. But is it going to be the best for whatever his goal is? Well, we'd have to figure out or ask him what his goal is. But, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a default here. So when someone walks in or when someone walks into the workshops that I teach, I, I know if I want to demonstrate something, it's like, okay, I'm going to choose that person. I'm going to choose that person. I'm going to choose that person. Because it's, it's likely based upon experience that we might see the thing that I want to, to demonstrate. Hmm. With, when it comes to sort of like going into exercise selection, we, we, we've basically, you answered the question already about should people squat bench and deadlift? Because generally mm. the answer is not necessarily it depends on you know the goal and you know the shape and structure and everything else but where where do you feel this lines because one of the things i i experienced when i started learning these things and when i was in an environment with people learning these things because i wasn't the first person of where i was to to learn all this stuff is that i come in and i'm i'm, I'm squatting two three times a week right and I, I dread to think now with 10 years of experience and looking at people's squat, what it actually looked like. I can't know if it's good. But I was like, people were assessing me. I was the general guinea pig because my, my squat is terrible and big, long theme has a big, long wingspan. I'm, I'm the, the archetypal client example when it comes to team meetings for the last 10 years. And we're looking at sort of squat going, you shouldn't squat. You know, it should be, you know, your hat squat and your split squat and your single leg stuff and also. Awesome. And that's great. And that, that is the argument we made earlier on. Finding that place where someone is to what range can they own and working them there hard. But we went through this thing here where for years, I never even touched that lift again. And we can say, maybe I shouldn't ever. But at some point, there's, there's a, a longevity to training to keep people mentally engaged that I'm not going to, at some point, leg extensions and split squats aren't, aren't going to be able to be loaded in the same way to keep progressing. So, when it, I'm going to use a squat as an example because I reckon this is the most versatile here. Yeah. Is, is there an argument that everyone can squat, but it's finding the right setup for you and maybe the right accessory exercises? So, for example, if someone has a position where they are squatting a bit more like a deadlift, that isn't a bad thing whatsoever, but maybe your accessory work is more quad focused, more upright, more knee flexion based stuff because of what's limited in the first exercise, vice versa, if you're three foot four on a tiny femur and you're completely upright, you may need to do more glutes and more hamstrings and things that are not involved in that. Is that an argument or would you say like there are different ways to progress them and maybe that lift should not be touched again? That, that really depends upon the person. And I'll give you a really easy example. Um, I had a client, we talked about yoga um, and I had a client that came in and she was a yoga teacher and she was coming in, you know, 10 to 15% of our clients come in because they have had an injury, a chronic injury. They've, they've sought help from physiotherapists and um, osteopaths and chiropractors. And, and they're looking for, you know, how can they build their body, make their body bulletproof to kind of get back to performance. So this yoga teacher was here and um, I'd been referred from other yoga teachers that, 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 that found me. And we were going through all of these things and building her body up. And there's a particular position that she was getting into at the beginning of her training with me, 
that as soon as she got into this position, pain kicked in. And it's like, okay, so we've got some sort of a metric. It's a subjective metric, it's a metric nonetheless. And so, you know, I figured out what, what was required in terms of ankles and knees and hips and all of that stuff and built all of these exercises. And we trained for this period of time. Everything, every metric that we could measure improved apart from the one thing that she came for. She wanted to get into this position. And every time she got into this position, based upon what had happened around her ligaments of her spine, pain kicked in. So we tried to do a little bit more work, but every time she got into this position, pain kicked in. And so at that point I was like, I've gone as far as I can help. Should she have done that thing? That's not up to me to kind of go, she should do this or she shouldn't do this. That's up to me to kind of go, Hey, this is, this is what's happening when you get into this position and this pain is kicking in. You've got to make the choice. You're an adult. You've got to make the choice whether you want to do this. And so the reason why I'm sharing this story here is, is kind of like with the, the, the squat. So the squat, you know, why did you do the squat in the first place? What was your goal? When I, when I started, it was initially just to try and grow the biggest quads possible. And then so stop there, so stop there, so stop yeah. there, so stop there, because because what I want to do is jump off that. So you want to grow the biggest quads possible. So based upon the way that you've seen your squat, did the squat grow your quads? Absolutely. Well, my quads grew, but it's not it's not because of my squatting. Absolutely not. So without any other goal, hmm. should you do a squat if that's the one goal? No. Okay. Now we can look at all the other stuff, right? Do you enjoy squatting? Yes. Okay. Then maybe you should squat. Do you actually just enjoy doing this movement and the challenge of seeing these numbers increase? However that happens, yes. Okay. Then you should do it. There's, there's, there's the, 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 the way that we want to think about exercise design is not that you should do this or you shouldn't do this, like as a blanket statement. It's more, why are you showing up today? What is it that you actually want? Because you know, I do some really dumb stuff. And I know you do too. And some of our clients do really dumb stuff, you know? So I've got clients that do CrossFit. I, you know, in next month, I'm going to be at Silverstone racing a, a car. You know, it's like, you know, we do all of this stuff that, that might not be apparently safe, but it's fun. And actually, this is what we want to do. So we need to build our bodies to be able to tolerate those things if that's what we want to do. But bring it back to the, to the, to the health component of this, is this going to have a negative effect doing that squat for you? Well, that, that, that's a bigger conversation mm -hmm. because if it is, and if I can measure that, if I can show you, if I can demonstrate, and then I present to you and go, hey, I know you want to squat, but here's what's happening to your hip joint or your lumbar spine or whatever else it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting way to look at that, certainly in terms of like doing things because they're fun. Because I think 90% of the people listening to this and wants to, to train, they, they think their goal is improve body composition, look better naked. And, 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 it, and it probably is. But I feel there's like, if you have two ends of the spectrum, you have the, like the power lifter or the athlete, you have the bodybuilder on two ends of the spectrum. You have the bodybuilder really only cares about the way they look. They like to get a bit stronger, but they don't really mind that much as long as they look better at the end of the day. The power lifter and the athlete, as long as they perform better, they probably like to look a little bit, look a little bit bigger or a little bit leaner, but it doesn't really matter. Now, I think most people fall on a spectrum here where most of my clients, yeah, the goal is probably close to the bodybuilder in mind, but we've got to understand that there are, there are emotional attachments to certain things that if we want someone to look they want to want to have a six pack. There's a nutritional component which requires emotional connection to food and eating things like this. And if your numbers don't go up on X lift, or if you don't enjoy a particular session, is the chance of you going home feeling like you failed, and in turn then going and eating everything in the house, going to increase. So in that example, is having a bit of what you want bolstered with a bit of what you need the right approach and finding where's that line of where it's safe and where it's like, okay, if, if you enjoy squatting, it's going to make you go home feeling good and eat better. I will then build the rest of the program to work around that. 100%, 100%. So can you 
deliver what they want or deliver what they need wrapped in what they want. So that, that's, that's absolutely, and that's the whole point of this, right? The whole point of, of we go on all of these courses is to get more information that we can apply to the individual. Well, why are we actually studying? Why are we doing all of these courses? What's the point in doing all of this? So the point for me was, well, the client was coming to me and paying me for, for a particular result and I wasn't delivering that. Or I was delivering that, but it had this side effect. Well, that, that doesn't work for me because they didn't ask for this. <laughs> they didn't ask for, you know, pain and niggles and all of this stuff. They asked for this. So how can I get really precise with my interventions? And my interventions might be the type of exercise, the, the way that I want them to feel during a rep. Um, you know, the more that we can uh, understand the ingredients and play with them, we get to build different recipes. And the re recipe is, how can I encourage you to fall in love with exercise in the way that I fell in love with exercise? And my recipe is completely different. But if you're going to do this for the rest of your life, which you're going to be a client of mine for the rest of your life, because that's, 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 that's my goal. And if, if I can do that and encourage you to, to, to keep on progressing, I've got to figure out what, what really turns you on. Mm. What is it that you love about exercise? even if you don't know it right now. Mm. So like moving on to, we've spoken about sort of like the extra selection, the bigger lifts, the squat, the bench, deadlifts. But one of the biggest things I feel that, that stops people going into the gym for the first time and having that sort of overwhelm is not knowing what they're doing with all this equipment, all these machines, they have no idea what they are doing. And this brings us often to the topic of machines. Mm. And how do people go about, maybe when they don't necessarily have um, the years of wealth of experience and knowledge that you have. And I know this is a broad topic, but one that you have dedicated courses to equipment analysis, um, assessing their own machineries. And why is it that a, a chest press in one gym will not feel like a chest press in another gym? That, that is, a, we could spend a couple of years talking about that nonstop, yeah. for sure. Um, but, 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 you know, let, let, let's break it down into two things about what, what it is that we're actually dealing with in a really simple way. And then let's think of something that people can try out today if they're going to get into the gym today. Um, so when you think about an exercise, what's, how does that exercise become uh, the currency for change? Meaning when you get into a chest press machine, how does that become like a, a chest exercise? Well, there's a distribution from the weight stack somehow through all the limbs of the machine and then the limbs of the body and then the pec is engaged. And so that should be kind of like a, a starting point. Like there's got to be some transition of this force through the body. So that's pretty cool. Okay, let's think about that. So when you think about the chest press, there's a capability of your body. When you're in the bottom of the bench press or the chest press, you're a little bit weaker. As you reach the top, you're a little bit stronger. That's it. That's, 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 that's the same for everyone. That's a consistent, that's, that's a general trend. So then you look at all of these different pieces of equipment and different suppliers and different makers have different philosophies. Some of them build their machines so that at the bottom where you're weaker, they're actually a little bit lighter. And then as you reach the top, they're getting heavier as you're getting stronger. So if you think about the stimulus at the bottom, it's probably going to be fairly appropriate. And as you get to the middle, it's appropriate. And as you get to the top, it's appropriate. If you're thinking about creating this challenge, which is consistent, which might be useful for some people. Then there are some makers of the chest press machine that haven't got a clue what I've just said. And they're copying someone else's model or they've got a different philosophy or they're just thinking, how can I cut costs? And so you're in this machine and it's actually heavier when you're in your weaker position. And then once you get stronger, that thing gets so light, it fl flows away. And you see this on the leg curl, you see this on the leg press, you see this on different machines. So the stimulus is gonna feel really different there. So I don't know who's listening, what equipment you've got access to, and we're talking Technogym, Nautilus, Cybex, Matrix, Life Fitness, pre there's, there's a bunch of them. One of the things that you could do just to kind of experience this is get into your machine 
make it relatively heavy if it's appropriate for you and just slow down and actually just get a sense of what's happening. So in that chest press, it should feel like it's as heavy at the bottom and the top, or even it should feel like it's getting a little bit heavier as you reach the top. Hmm. Now, what do you do with that if you find it's the opposite way? That, that, that's another conversation. But it's just a fun thing for us to just to kind of actually become a little bit more connected with that movement, with our bodies. What does our body feel? And in, in essence, we might, we, might, we might experience something different there. There's, um, that's a really, really interesting point. I, something I, I remember a, a, a quote from, from Ben Bukowski again. I know his name's come up a few times. But he was like, earn the right to go quickly. I remember him talking yeah. about like signing your name. Like I'm left-handed. If I sign my name in my right hand, I wouldn't do this. I'd go slow and perfect. Yeah. And then when you're looking at improving execution or just like this, learning about equipment, it's like, like go slow first. And then like, what's the, you, you see bodybuilders all the time that go, well, you've got to explode out the hole on a, on a chest press or a dumbbell press. And like, okay, we can, there's another, there's another conversation we had of whether that is the right thing to do or not. But the big elephant in the room here is that if you take Arnold explaining at the bottom of a, a bench press, he's got so much, for lack of a better term, mind muscle awareness, so much control and ability to fire that peck that he can go incredibly quick and it's still everything he wants it to be. Whereas yeah. someone on, you know, has absolutely no, like day one in the gym, doesn't have that awareness and it just becomes throwing it. And this could be the difference between somebody who kicks off a, a bench press who maybe is built for it, but still goes, I feel it in my shoulders and on my chest. And it's just that awareness of like, okay, how do I fire this? And going slow, I think is that that, yeah. that almost precursor to start to learn, okay, how do, what sequence does things work in? How do I control this weight? Yeah. And there's, there's actually a lot of things to consider. For us as a professional, when we get someone into a machine, so we're thinking about the, the, the position that we get their joints into, the movement, the path of motion that we're going through, the amount of support and restraint and, and their intent, like how are they thinking about pushing on the machine and then we've got the resistance up. Uh, we could, we, you know, we could get into the, to the, to the, to the detail side of this. Um, but you're right, you know, if you uh, go back to our sporting reference, um, you know, when I do that track thing at Silverstone, the guy that's going to take me around will tell me that I should go to this point here, but I'm not going to be going with my foot to the floor on that first rep, meaning that first lap of the track. The next one, I'm going to go a little bit faster. And then next one, I'm going to go even faster. And then I'm going to keep doing that all day long, meaning the more control I've got over that vehicle, the faster I'm going to go. Because the goal of racing is to be as fast as possible. But the goal of racing is not to crash the car. Do you see that you've got the, the, the effect and the side effect? So we're in that dumbbell bench press. Is it beneficial for someone who has the control to do so to explode from the bottom? Yeah, absolutely. But if you're exploding at the bottom and if that becomes the priority of a control, and you're all over the place. You can't maintain the scapula if that's, that's, that's what you want to do. Your path of motion of the dumbbell is all over the place. Your spine's moving. Your pelvis is moving. Your feet are moving. If you're not in control, you've got no right to be going faster because all you're going to do is crash the car. I suppose it depends on, the on the goal as well. I mean, we, we, again, bringing that back. Is mm. your goal, that car at Silverstone, is your goal to win a drag race? Or is your goal to look at the sights and go around the course? And that's supposed to be exactly. that power lifter who may, I just need to get this bar up through any means necessary. Whereas when we're looking at someone who's trying to build muscle, that goal is creating a high level of tension. So while an explosion yeah. is still maybe beneficial to a degree, not in the same yeah. way, just moving weight. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you think about something like a kettlebell swing and you've got a 20K kettlebell, again, this is fun and I get it. Um, we've got some kettlebells lying around here. It's fun to do that movement, but your goal there is not to place a body on the challenge at every degree of the movement. So if your goal was to actually stimulate the tissue for growth, we actually want to place the tissue under challenge. So if you're Olympic lifting, 
the kettlebell and you're swinging it up and now it's just the inertial effects of that mass that's carrying it to the top. That's going to be less of a challenge at certain points of the range than if you were actually, you know, lifting this up or doing something like a deadlift. Hmm. So when you, this is maybe more of a now like a follow up for, for coaches. So when we're looking at the differences, whether it's differences in machines or differences in parts of the range of a lift, it's become very popular off the back of people doing more RTS to throw daisy chains and bands and, you know, where you'll sometimes with certain coaches, you don't know whether it's a chest press or a sex swing and everything in between. So for, for these purposes, like one, why are these things, do you th- of these things used? Because I know you use them. And where is this balance between, for like the beginner, where it's, it actually makes things better for the beginner in a lot of ways because they don't have to try and throw force. The execution is probably going to be better because it, it's a more appropriate load. But on the flip side, where does that become such an overwhelming thing for someone coming into the gym where there's just all these gadgets and contraptions they know nothing about rather than just getting onto a machine? That's it. Or just, you know, lifting a simple dumbbell if that's all you've got, which many of us had during this COVID period when we were training from home. Um, Do you need, uh, you know, we talked about this capability of the body and Tom Purvis calls this the strength profile of the body. And then he also coined a term called the resistance profile of the exercise, meaning where the exercise is heavier and where it's lighter. Do you need them to match to be perfect all the time? No, no, you don't. What are the influences in the exercise? Well, there's an influence on joint force, muscle stimulus, soft tissue, um, the amount of fatigue that will kick in is the amount of glycogen depletion that will occur based upon what you choose to do with that. And then can you change that resistance profile, add in chains or bands? Yeah, absolutely, you can. Do you have to do it? No. It's one of those things that if my accountant can figure out a better way for me to save some, you know, corporation tax, I'm happy for him to do so. But if he starts doing some, something really complex that doesn't actually change how much tax I'm paying, then I'm paying him too much. He's spending too much time on this. Mm -hmm. And, And that's the same here. Like if we're banding everything, we might be missing out on something. If we're, really truly understanding a machine to understand when it should be banded and when it shouldn't do we want that resistance profile to change like that do we want the inertial effects to change like that are we really sure are we really sure that's important oh, that becomes a bit more of a of a question so so there are some things i'm not on instagram that frequently hmm. um i'm sure there's really good stuff on there but every time i go on there seems to be a cesspool of people Uh, bitching about one another and that doesn't really help my clients and so but 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 sometimes you see people setting exercises up and it's like that band's got too much tension that just allows you to add more discs that band's not got enough tension or that's kicking in actually when you're getting weaker that's that's the wrong way around or it's just a lot there's a lot of ingredients before we get to that that's kind of like the magic sauce at the end we need to understand you know actually can your client control the movement? You know, if they're doing a bench press, can they control the scapula to the way that you want them to? When they're doing a deadlift, can they maintain this position? Because you strap in bands from the top or the bottom of the rack and the deadlift, but they're all over the place, we're kind of missing the point. There's, 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 a, there's a lot more before we get to that point. But, you know, it looks sexy and it looks sexy on Instagram, I'm sure. And, and, and people want the advanced stuff. Um, as you said, we use it. I've got, you know, uh, on my leg press behind the camera here, I've got a particular daisy chain and some bands. So it kicks in at a particular point in the range. But on this one here, if I've got LeBron James here, clearly he's going to be going a different range. And I want that band to be kicking at a, a, a perfect point in that range for him. For me, my range is like this. So I need to be getting it kicking in at like, you know, a certain point in that range for me, which means that the band needs to be different. The daisy chain length needs to be different. Like if we're going to do this, we've got to do it properly. Right. And this goes back to, this goes back to a little bit as well. Like what can you do if you don't have these things? It's like 
taken away this thought process of everything has to be a full range of motion. We alluded to it with the bar touching the chest and the bench press and the squat having to be, you know, below your knees. Um, that f- full range of motion for what? Full range of motion for who? And when we when we look at that, it's like, well, is there an argument here if, if a lateral raise, for example, which is the example everyone always gives when it comes to uh, like strength curves and resistance profiles, that's you know, heaviest when you're weakest. Yeah, you could get into a cable machine or we could do some things to make it much, much more appropriate. Or we could actually say it's not a bad thing to do partial ranges with a heavier load at the bottom position and just add an extra exercise. Now, going back to your, your account analogy, which is really, really good. Yeah, that's potentially throwing more overall stress in the body but if you only have that you can do a lot with very little without having this overwhelming thing or maybe just going above your grade of understanding and actually not getting the effect you wanted in the first place that's it that's it if we overcomplicate things and and and, and i've seen you know um people come through my workshops where they leave and they get excited by the complicated stuff and then you forget that actually a part of the exercise equation is intensity or effort. Like, are you actually creating enough of a stimulus to create a change? Because you might set up the perfect resistance profile, but A, if the client's bored or if they're not engaged or if they can't actually do the required effort, ah, then what are we doing? What are we doing? It's just, you know, we're, we're kind of getting into that uh, appearance of knowledge. But if it doesn't actually change what you do and make an impact with your client, we're playing a different game. I think the I game think for it, me is how do I get the best results? Mm. I, I, I think this applies to everything as well. Obviously, what we've talked about is like exercise selection, exercise execution, and, and the mechanics side of things. But one of the you mentioned things that you you got into this because you saw problems with people that you faced. And for me, one of the ones that I faced for a very long time was like volume landmarks, right? So you have two schools of thought in terms of how much volume should you put on somebody. And you have people like Jordan Peters and the guys, you know, Callum Braystrick and Muscle Mentors and Luke, and I know who they've, you know, worked work with you quite a lot, right? Who are very much the advocates of the, the door in the eights, Mike Menza style, one to two top sets, like low volume, massively high intensity. And I, for years, like, thought that was the rest of the right way to, to be. And for a lot of people, it is. In the sense of, I can take away a lot of extra stress in the system, I can go in, make an exercise really perfect and just get what I need and get out. And in, in theory, everyone should be working towards that with the exercise that fit their structure. But I've, I, I found for so many times I'm trying to do those programs with clients where as you, you, you hit the nail on the head with, is the client bored? Is the client engaged? They're minding. It was a mind in the meeting beforehand where, yeah, in theory, that's great. But you do two sets for somebody and they're like, OK, what's next? And they're running off, not even broken a sweat. And I'm like, it's not the right level of volume for that client. On the flip side, you'll have like, sort of like Mark Isatel goes into the, the MRV and the higher end spectrum of this. Whereas you, maybe if you take that approach and you give it to a really, really good, efficient bodybuilder, might be like, it's just, I just can't recover from it. It's just way too much. And that same level of interpretation when it comes to programming there, and it's interesting when I speak to people about programming and sometimes they have their biases and it's like, you deal with people that your weakest person lifts the 45 kilo dumbbells on a chest press. Mm. Or, or you deal with complete beginners or mum, like new mums. The difference in terms of volume arts and the way you think about programming is huge. And it's like, where is this middle ground of, I, 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 I quite like when it comes to building my purchase programs, ramping sets up. Because if I start someone on what I would like them to be at, like a, like a two sets, and they might find that they go, not getting it, I can increase, I can increase, I can increase until that point where they just find they're just struggling enough. And then I can just back off that little bit and keep them there. So the people who are beginners may go to the higher level of the, the Isotel approaches, the, the MRVs, and the more advanced people may stay at the bottom. That's fine, but we'll mm. just run where you kind of get stuck and we'll go there. But these, these like camps are going off and jittering now onto tangents, but the, the same thing with exercises, these camps of things where if it works for one person, it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. So, 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 so you're talking about toolbox hmm. and you're talking about different ways that you're going to apply those tools. And for sure, you know, I can take my water bottle here and use it as a hammer. And, you know, I can also, you know, and, 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 
to be honest, not with this water bottle, but I have done that. I've been lazy and I've not got a hammer and I've just used it as a hammer and you can kind of smash that thing and it kind of works, doesn't it? Until it doesn't or until it breaks my water bottle. And, you know, the, the, the thing with the volume that I often think about, you know, you've got the, uh, the, the amount of intensity mm. and then the amount of volume and, and that those two terms are probably not lost on most people here. Like if you, if you work incredibly hard in one set, you might not be able to do that many sets and vice versa. Um, so what's the minimum effective dose? And then, then what's the maximum that they can recover? So what do we need to think about with the client? Well, what is their allostatic load? Um, what is their recoverability? So I have a client that lives in London and works in New York, which means he commutes every single week. So uh, I bet you can guess what his recoverability is like because he's crossing time zones twice a week, every single week. <laughs> and, you know, we've, we've nailed his nutrition. We've nailed his sleep within the confine, you know, the construct of what he presents with. His exercise is phenomenal. Um, and so we're doing the best that we can, supplements, all of that stuff, you know, the bigger, wider, you know, we're, you know, the bigger, wider uh, client project management that we're kind of, that we specialize in. But I'm not going to do uh, 10 sets of 10 with him. He would, it would destroy him. But I've got another person who's an athlete that can recover from that. They actually sleep seriously 10 and a half hours every single night consistently they're 19 years old and what i can do with that person is is vastly different mm. so the 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 the, the and, and i've got an example of one thing which is kind of in, in the middle of a client that was struggling to develop their quads and so we actually use the moxie monitor which measures the amount of muscle oxygen and figured out a protocol for this guy and this guy was uh you know had great development apart from his quads and his protocol on the leg extension that we've put together was six sets of seven reps to momentary muscular failure and we defined what that looks like as well so six times seven twice per week and over a period of six weeks the the the, the result from that yielded a, a two centimeter increase in circumference of his thighs which is pretty cool this guy has been training for, for over 10 years, maybe, maybe a bit longer. But, but where is that in the textbook? Like, that's, that's not there. That's actually somewhere in the middle of those two camps. But that was the, the protocol that was, that was right for this guy because we measured something. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to do the rambling thing now as well. So yeah. I, I, but I, think, I think there's also a gray area with this as well, right? In terms of like, so the, the examples there you brought up with the guy who's massively stressed is going across, across borders. So mm -hmm. the old school way of thinking that if, if someone is recoverability is better, they could potentially do more in the terms of volume. You, you mentioned allostatic load. So they, the old school analogy, people don't know what that means. If I've got this bowl here, I've got this big two liter bottle that people can't see. I've got this huge scope hit here because it's two thirds empty for training volume, calorie deficit, whatever else. But if it was full, some like poor sleep or time zones, I haven't got that much room. So in theory, the emptier that bottle is, the more volume that that person can recover from, they could do more sets. But I've almost found in a lot of, in general, when you bring the emotion side of this and the brain into this, I've almost found in practice, quite often it's quite the opposite because the people who are the most stressed and in theory should be doing the lower end of sets also are the people that come in thinking of their next meeting or their last meeting or what's going on with their partner or the stuff that's going on with their kids or their rough text on their phone between sets. So their efficiency within each set is considerably less. And I, one of the reasons why I like almost step, step load is something actually different when you're looking at strength wells, but I step up volume week by week is because I find that the, you know, I was fine for a while. I was like, there's, there's clients that are, no matter how much you try and get them to slow down and control, they're, they're, their minds are in it. Or marrying that level of what they want and what they need, they come in with this preconception that I just want to get a bit of aggression out in the gym. That's what I enjoy about the gym. Right? They're not necessarily here to slow and squeeze and everything like this. So I've got this dilemma when someone wants to build some muscle mass that I go, okay, 
I need to create more on a progressive overload in some way in terms of volume and in the old school way of looking at volume of sets times reps times load. But mm-hmm. I don't necessarily feel comfortable increasing the load on this bar or the load in the, their hands because no matter what I do, I'm getting 1% better each time in terms of their execution, but it's not as good. They haven't got the level of control to really feel safe with this. So what other mm-hmm. tools have I got in the toolbox to increase a progressive overload? I could increase repetitions. I, or I could increase sets. And I often find that the people who actually don't recover that well, the people who end up doing the higher end sets, but each set isn't as efficient as that bodybuilder who comes in as two really hard sets and we can, we can sort of move on. But I've got a guy who um, did his result me last year, got through and had a photo shoot and he's a big drinker, but going out and on the drinking every weekend is always a sticking point, right? And he got there. And now we've moved into a sort of building phase. These Most clients don't really want to build muscle as much as they say, but he really does. So we start to the point where he's, the load he's lifting and how hard he's working is getting really close to where his limit is. And he's now got to the point where he doesn't want to drink as much anymore. So he's actually, his sets are actually going down because each of those sets are becoming way more efficient as he now comes in fresher, you know, less stress, recovering better, but in turn, working considerably harder. Mm. It's really cool. So what you're saying is in in terms of if we think about the client and if we think about everything that we need to consider before we can choose an exercise regime, an exercise prescription, we need to think about, you know, their lifestyle, their nutritional status, their their mindset or mind flow. We need to think about what, what have they done to their body before coming in in terms of what's their integrity and health of their joints we need to think about their cardio respiratory system like what's their heart rate variability what's their you know resting heart rate their blood pressure we need to think about all this potential stressors what type of work that they do you know where do they where do they switch off where do they have margin Hmm. margin is that point in between where you're actually kind of progressing to something and you sleep and it's that it's that white space in your life um we need to know all of this stuff before we go, this is the exercise and this is how many you should do. But this, the, and that, that's the, you know, what, what, you know, I, I spoke at a conference uh, a few days ago and um, we talked about the exercise rules and the exercise rules exists primarily because of two things. One, because we're externally measured. We're doing a sport. When I did the 100 meters, it couldn't be client defined because I'm being assessed against seven other runners. You know, if we're doing a powerlifting meet or if we're doing that, I have a client that flew over from Dubai to come to do a a semi-final CrossFit thing here in London. And they've got to reach a certain position. It's the rules of the exercise. It's the rules of the sport. And similarly, when, when me and you started out in the industry, we had to start somewhere. We had to figure out, you know, what are the rules of the lap pull down? Because imagine giving this amount of detail to someone who's never looked at this, that'd be, that'd be overwhelming. And so, so the rules exist for a reason. It's just, I'm, 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 I, I, I will put money on it that a lot of people listening in have experienced where the rules have not worked for them. Have you ever had lower back pain, hip pain, neck pain, shoulder pain? like all of these things, because we're trying to fit into this predetermined approach to exercise. And if you haven't, sweet, amazing, keep going. You don't have to change anything, but that's not why we're here and talking right now. Mm -hmm. We're trying to serve more people, not the 5% of the world that exercise is built for. You've got 95% of people out there that are not doing anything. Mm. It's, it's, it's interesting you say that in terms of like having having the rules and you mentioned the lap pull down like there are certain amount of rules you need you need to sort of understand how a lap pull down is to be able to learn how to individualize a lap pull down like you almost need to find a rigid structure break that apart to rethink about how that structure works and mm. it's interesting because when we talk about individualizing training programs that there's this there's this thing in the industry maybe i have a unique approach to this but people hate on templates people hate on systems And Mm -hmm. I have a massively different opinion on this. I think the way to truly individualize a program is to have a template in place to a degree. When people look at, I I see coaches all the time spend way too much stress, energy, overwhelmed by going, right, I I cannot give a template. I have a blank page every single time. 
And like, you've done seven sessions that day. You're tired. You're not thinking straight. You've got so many other things going on in your life. In the same way that a client would have when they come into your gym of all these other things in your life. And you saying you can do your best work. I, I would, if I wanted a truly individualized program from Michael Golden, I would don't think you would build the parameters of your programming based off of the volume that I need, things like this, from all this experience you've had from 1995 and be able to put together the big rocks. And then you come in and go, right, what do we need to adjust from these big rocks to fit Simon and Simon's structure? What is the range of motion he has in this exercise? And then you've got that time and that freedom to sort of be creative and be individualizing without starting from scratch and just being overwhelmed with where to start. Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. And if in the in the individual rep i get to be there with you to go no i think you've got another one mm. or no you need to stop but that that's that's the that's the the individuality goes down all the way down to the individual rep but you're right if you don't have a system we have a you know a project management system every client is a project and the way that that system is set up and we have these quarterly you know, structures in place, just in the way that, that you do in other businesses. And within that quarter, here's the goal, for, the goals for this quarter, here's the outcome, here are the process goals, here are the steps that we need to do to, to get us there. How many individual programs within a quarter, that might be two, it might be three. And then within that program, here's the, here's, here's a system, here's a framework. Now, at this point, then we start to go, well, based upon the need of the client, and based upon the process goals that's going to get them to their outcome, this is what this looks like. Hmm. We're not we're not starting. You've got to have a system. If you're starting from a blank thing, then you have to be an artist every single time, and you have to repeat the same process. And if you repeat in the same process, you're in essence inefficient, and your your ability to impact more people is diminished. And we, you've got we... to automate. And you've got to systemize. And going back, I always find podcasts always has a brilliant habit of coming full circle. And, but you mentioned at the start, very start of this, about how you were very data driven and how you are, you know, you like to, every client's a project and finding out, okay, this works for this person. If you're starting a blank page every time, you are never learning from the last one because you're never going to remember mm -hmm. 20 years worth of experience. If you can have a system that can be refined as you learn more about the individual and then you can then make those small adjustments, each program you write, each template you write, each um, goal-specific program you write just gets a little bit better over time to you sort of have this thing, right, okay, which of these tools am I going to use? All these tools are already built. I'm not build, building the tools now. I've built the tools. Let's just go, okay, I need to tighten this nut. Here you go. Here's the tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. But with that in mind, what's your, like, what's your thoughts on periodization? Because you mentioned earlier on that the, you, you got all the things that are coming in Sleep, mentality, stress, everything that's happened, nutritional status, these things that you have an inability to control affect what you do in that individual session. So mm. how much of an ability do we really have as coaches to plan long term when it comes to programming, when it could be completely different every single time they come into the gym? Mm. Again, you know, if your client is an athlete and they're going to be, you know, competing in the World Cup in November, then you've got a timeline. If they have a date for their competition, that's where periodization in the traditional sense, the two to bumper, two to bumper sense and, and all of those guys, that, that's where that really kind of helps us. And then you can have multi-year kind of approaches for our personal training clients, they're here for health and fitness and wellness and some performance. It might be a little bit different because also we have clients that are with us for 10, 15, 20 years. So how are you going to, to manage that? that that's, that's more where we've still got a long range perspective, which is, you know, we're choosing exercises now to maintain the in integrity of their body five, 10, 15 years from now. Hmm. How can we minimize joint uh, forces at a particular point in the range for this individual? We have that long range view, but in terms of the programming that gets, it's more, you know, for, for the next year, let's say there's a framework and a skeleton and it's, and it's fuzzy. I know what they want to achieve then. And then, and then, so then we can start to track the course, hmm. but I know for the next two quarters, this is where it looks like, but 
shit happens. Things change. And, but things change. A client may walk in, you know, to someone today and they didn't sleep that well last night for whatever reason. It was 36 Celsius in London yesterday. So some people didn't sleep last night. And so that means you've got to change on the fly. And this is where you have your program. And this is like the, the framework. This is the overview. But your note keeping, how you're taking notes on that session, what they turned up with, all of that information, you've got to take into account as well. Because mm. then, you know, we review our client uh, projects. Why is this client not progressing? Well, because they were ill here and they did this and this happened. And then we can present that back to the client. Mm. And that, that's, that's where... You know, it's this is this is going into a bigger conversation now, but that that's how we think about programming. Programming is part of the project management. Mm. I, I I couldn't agree with that more. When I look at sort of like things like things like periodization, essentially for me, it's like right, that's the sky deciding almost which skeleton you use. I always look at program design as almost like by paint by numbers, right? Okay, cool. What's the mm. biggest thing that I can make a decision on now that will influence mm. the majority of the program? So I almost look at periodization as this, the top of that spectrum. It doesn't mean it's the most important because it's something on the fly, but it would dictate, if someone says to me, I want a goal, my goal is to build the most amount of muscle humanly possible. Then I'm looking at this overarching periodization structure of, okay, right now they're a complete beginner. They probably can't generate that much intensity to get much of a hypertrophy stimulus. So I'm going to be strength endurance, but I want to get them to a hypertrophy stimulus. Okay, there's a linear periodization model. Fantastic. That means I know block one's probably going to be 12 reps plus. Oh, if I know 12 reps plus is there, then I'm not going to do 10 sets of 12 with mm -hmm. five minute rests. I'm probably going to do three sets with 60 seconds rest. And then every decision becomes easier based on the overarching principle. And going back mm -hmm. to systems, if I have all that in place, I can spend more time on what's truly the personal thing. It's like, right, what does this client have? How does the exercise selection, because that's where the creativity mm -hmm. comes, is like, how does yeah. this exercise selection fit them you know if, if i want to do some sort of vertical pressing movement have they got a vertical where is that vertical is it here do i have to think outside the box to get that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if, I, if i was having to think about every little thing in a program every single time someone came in the door i i, I just wouldn't have the, the mental bandwidth to do it mm -hmm. it'd be overwhelming mm. so mm. I could I could literally chat this uh, to with you for hours and hours on end, and I am definitely going to come and come and see you within the next six weeks when I'm back. But to a couple of little closing questions before we find out how we you know where people can can find you, so they can also come and you know pay a bit of money to learn about all this stuff. Um, first off, I heard in the podcast that you are a big fan of tequila. Now, yeah, I I I want to I want to because I don't dislike tequila. But how on earth did you become such a big fan of tequila? Because most people's experience with tequila is shots, lemon, salt, and 2 a.m. And it's like, it's not a drink that people lend themselves to. I appreciate that tequila can be brilliant. But how did that happen? I guess that might have happened with uh, a friend of mine, Jack Taylor, in Los Angeles. And the nervous system. Dude. Trying. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, uh, and, 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 and sampling some tequila. In fact, now I went to another place as well that they just had this tequila tasting thing. And I was like, let's, let's, let's try it and let's, let's go. And um, it was phenomenal. And if your tequila requires lime and salt and, you know, you're licking your hands, then it's, it, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> this is a uh, um, good tequila is, is phenomenal in terms of, um the taste and complexity and you can go to such a breadth like people do with wines and different types of whiskeys and things like that so mm. yeah I, I, I agree with that so much so like i i'm a big fan of whiskey and i'm a big fan of gin and both of those if done right can be had without much else added to it particularly whiskey yeah straight whiskey yeah. Can, be, it can be incredible but it's never appreciated yeah. because it's it's either mixed with coke or it's uh it's, it's, it's down the hatch as quickly as possible, or it's bought cheap. So there's 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 some Japanese whiskies that um, I was given a, a, a thing for Christmas where it was like an advent calendar with all these different Japanese whiskies. That was uh, that was a drunken December, um, <laughs> yeah. but that was that actually that that carried on past Christmas because it was like I, I can't I can't keep doing this every day. But that was, that was phenomenal. <laughs> Just coming to work slightly buzzed every day. 
you know, that's it. <laughs> measuring lines of force all over the place like this. Um, <laughs> so, like, as we said at the start of this show, you've you've been someone who has really changed the way many coaches in the UK, like certainly at least within my bubble in terms of coaches think about exercise. And you're you seem a man that's driven to to push the industry forward and push the quality of personal training. Where do you see this industry going within the next five years? And what is there anything that you want to particularly see developed further? Whether it's something that's in your control that you want to push further or something you feel there's, there's just something that, that should be, have a better understanding within the wider public? You know, you've got the, um, there's a festival here in the Truman Brewery where there's lots of group exercise stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's, there's all these different options and different recipes for different types of classes, which I, I will never go to them. It, it's, 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 it's not my flavor, and that's okay. There's got to be a market for everyone. But, but you know, if you think about personal training, I think that the more that we can get uh, a little bit more detail and a little bit more specific for the client and starting with the client rather than the rules. And that, that doesn't mean that we all have to kind of going to levels of detail right now. It's just, how can we increase that amount of detail? So the more that we can actually be recognized for the specialists that we are, because mm. we're exercise specialists, and amongst that, we, we're specialists in, in actually being able to manage the project of a client and improving their health and their fitness, wellness, and performance, um, which requires work from us. It requires work to actually do things and not just follow the same program for every client and not just kind of go, oh, that's going to be fine because that we, we need to, we need to differentiate from that share. Mm. Um, but the thing that I would really like um, is in the, in the gyms. So when you've got the, uh, you know, I'm doing some work with third space, which is a huge high end uh, health club chain here in London and witnessing what they're doing with their staff is phenomenal in terms of starting at the ground and building up from there. So if you think of uh, um, whatever market you're in, the big health club chains, you know, the Virgins or the David Lloyd, if, if we can actually, at that level, the gym instructor level, start to think about how can we make this built around every individual, it doesn't have to be that complex, but we might see better outcomes for our members and we might start attracting more people into that gym environment. Because frankly, most people, just think that the gym's not for them because exercise is uncomfortable. Exercise is painful. They don't get the results because they see this dude on Instagram or this woman on Instagram doing this. They think they have to do this. And it's like, no, no, that's not what is required. And that's the, I, I, I'd love for us to see that, you know, not only for the people that can afford to, to work with us, but the people who are paying, you know, just a general gym membership to actually, to actually get those benefits. Mm. I, 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 I love that sort of like that mission because it, there's so many levels to it as well. You mentioned group exercise at the start of this as well. And I, mm. I when I first started the industry and was very much a anti-group exercise guy, I was like, well, someone's not going to get a six pack and be, be in great shape doing Zumba. I'm like, yeah, but they don't want to. They, they're the person who wants to lose a couple of pounds whilst dancing around to Brazilian music. And me being saying how terrible that was, one, yeah. wasn't terrible for what what's the goal if they want to yeah. jump around and dance yeah. that's a great exercise two them losing that couple of pounds in a less overwhelming less scary environment might go well i'm going to go upstairs to the gym and see if i can lose two or three more pounds and then they're the mm. clients in the five years so having a look at that from an exercise class a group exercise perspective like how can we take this this stuff now that you're um you and tom purvis and a number of other guys now empowering the personal training community to do can we get to a point where exercise classes are more individualized and there's more scope exactly. within them? So people often start with classes. So if the people are getting better results with classes, there's less frustrated people in general, putting, even putting personal training aside, putting our individual business and livelihoods aside, can we get it that people may never go to personal training because they are getting results from the classes? Or even mm. mentioned working with third space, I'm assuming that's some examples from a staff perspective, but maybe also from an exercise machinery perspective, I presume. And you mentioned equipment being very different. Could more gyms have better quality equipment? Could, rather than improve, like saying, you should get Cybex or Prime or Atlantis, how can we encourage 
the 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 companies that maybe you said don't know what we, what what you were talking about earlier on to start looking at their equipment in better ways and having more exactly. companies giving a higher quality so more people go into the gym and get better results without ever having to think about classes or personal training they just get on a chest press and there's less chance of them mm. making mistakes or hurt themselves it's never going to be perfect as you said arm length femur length height but we can we can bring this margin for error down quite considerably so i really really like that answer yeah absolutely absolutely and that's the you know i started off as a gym instructor and when i started off as a gym instructor it was it was very much you know uh, 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 you were on the floor uh, connecting with people helping people out and i know that doesn't quite exist now it seems that people come into the industry and all of a sudden they're a personal trainer, which I think is a disservice to those individuals because you lose the ability to actually interact. You lose the ability to actually test things out and, and get better at your craft. All of a sudden, it's like you gotta, you got to pay your rent and that's it. You've got no opportunity. This is, this is not your apprenticeship now. You're, you're, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to, Get your business in order, and so 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 I think that we we we've lost potential there, and the personal trainers coming in have lost an opportunity. So, it's, but there's still something that we could do with that. Mm. And again, it's just you know starting with the individual, starting mm. with their client, and back to the class thing. Clearly, those people going to classes are intelligent. They just don't like what you're providing. Mm. They like what, what these guys are providing. That doesn't make them wrong. That's their experience. Have at it. And that's, that's, that's you know, you know if, we, if, we, if we step out of our experience and see people for their experience, we might be able to help them a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I say I, I, really, I really like the answer. There's so, so many levels to that. And so, again, full circle again in giving that a little bit of, what they need wrapped in what they want. The classes are giving us what we want. So can we create those classes in an environment that allows them to get more of what they need? And can we help yeah. the industry, training industry keep that high level of quality that, that is going in the right direction in terms of getting them what they want, but also mm. not losing out on, on what, the, what the client actually wants from each session at the same time. And I think it's a, yeah. you made a great point about the business side of things. I've, I certainly felt that in my, like my career as I, I'd love to almost like Matt times I've forgotten my career because I'd love I'd love a sabbatical, not because I don't want to stop working, but because I want to invest in my education and come back better. And sometimes you're right, you do get caught up in like, I need to have 30, 40 sessions a week, I need to pay my rent, I need to make ends meet, that you almost fill yourself up and run out of time to improve. And I think that's that's something that is it's is a really good point to close on. So for people yeah. that want to find you and learn from you, what how do people get in touch with? Michael, Integra, the online courses, in-person stuff. Tell us a bit about what you do. Uh, best place is to go to the website, which is integra-education.net. Uh, we do have an Instagram, which is integra.education. Those are, the, those are the, the two best spots and then everything from there. Um, the, the entry point for this with me is, is the exercise lab. The next one will be in September 2022. We're currently going through a series of workshops now that are all fully booked, but that's the next entry point. And then RTS Foundations, which is, which is we, we've, we've talked about that, we've quoted from Tom, that's what I teach here in the UK. That's actually available globally. So that's available in Asia. Um, I've got a, a friend who teaches around India and a friend who teaches over in Malaysia. Um, and it's available in the US as well and uh, Canada. And, uh, and obviously here in, uh, in Europe uh, with me. Um, so those are, the, those are the entry points. But the website is definitely the, the, the place to start. Hmm. I, I, I remember a few, a few months ago, there was a, there was a guy called Jay Hawley who um, works for a company called ATP over here, you know, fairly big hmm. gym, ring chain. And he was looking to sort of be able to, he's done a, a number of the RCS stuff with, 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 with Tom. And he was like, I'm going to be, be the guy to help bring this to Hong Kong. And then the pandemic happened and he moved to Singapore. So it's good to know there are parts of Asia 
uh, when the borders open up that I can I can go and get my get my mechanics fix. Um, but yeah, the, I will certainly arrange something with you when we uh, jump on this call. But man, thank you very much. I've really really enjoyed this. As I said there's a there are always really interesting conversations because you, you so often go down the interview format of just like question speak question back. But I always think it, this is the reason why I, I, I massively value everything you do in your education stuff because you always encourage me to think i always come off with more questions than i had going in which is something i don't do with most podcasts i come in and i go oh i answered all my questions fantastic whereas you all have this brilliant ability of take it make me think create that curiosity you mentioned at the start and i'm now going to want to go away and get into a book and go right okay i need to answer some of these questions i'll start thinking about on the show so thank you very much for your time it's been massively helpful and uh hopefully my see you pleasure. in a few weeks Absolutely. It's been a privilege. Thank you. Speak to you soon.